So good evening, everyone. Welcome to May 2022 webinar. And uh, thank you all for joining. I hope everyone is safe and sound in this COVID pandemic. I'm Shweta from Habal Technologies, and my team member Vimla and I are going to be your moderator and host for today's session. Today, we have a very fascinating topic called uh, how pandemic has changed the banking industry, where we will talk about how the banking industry are affected by the recent crisis we faced. Before we begin, I would like to cover a few housekeeping points, points for the audience. The webinar is live and recorded. Please make sure to connect your audio properly. The session is approximately one hour. We invite comments and questions from the attendees. So please post your questions in the chat box. We will hold it for discussion at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session. Uh, we will also be uploading this webinar video on YouTube. Before 15 minutes, we will share a feedback form so please uh, provide your responses to it. Uh, today we have uh, Mr. Mani Parthasarathy, uh, and uh, let me give you a brief introduction about him. He is the co-founder of Hubal Technologies. He has expertise in the IT industry with more than 15 years of experience. He has interviewed more than 50 experts in this industry. So, and now let us move into introducing our guest speaker for today, Mr. Tamil Bondhopadhyay. LinkedIn nominated him for three successive years as one of the top voices in finance. An award-winning author and journalist, he is an influencer in Indian finance and economy. He is a senior advisor of a small uh, finance bank, and he has been nominated as one of the top 25 voices in India across in India across sectors. Now I hand over the session to Mani. Uh by the way, thank you so much, Tamal, for uh, joining this uh, webinar. I really appreciate that. I, and midst of, uh, uh, yes, I, I completely understand that you are not uh, feeling well, but uh, thank you so much. In midst of it, you have joined, uh, Tamal. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mani. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, so without any further delay, I just uh, it's called, since it's been a Q&A kind of a session, right? So I'll be asking the list of questions that, is, that we have collected from the audience. Right. So, so without any further delay, uh, the first question goes like, um, so we have, it's like the pandemic has affected all the industries, right? Uh, uh, the last two years, which we were in India was suffering like anything. So we'd like to know what is the role of a banking sector with respect to the pandemic? If you can give a brief, then we can start the webinar with that. Come on, sir. Yeah, Mani, I think um, I was expecting this question because you said the impact of pandemic. So yeah. uh, this could be the, <laughs> uh, the first question. And it's, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, uh, as we speak <clears throat> for the just year ended uh, fiscal year 2022, mm. uh, the results of which have been out and Indian banks have done fabulously well. If I'm not mistaken, this is the best ever year for the industry. Mm. If you look at the banking sector's health, uh, both in terms of profitability or in terms of the resilience of the balance sheet, in terms of their adequately capitalized, uh, their NPAs, bad assets have not gone up to the extent we were apprehending. Mm -hmm. um, they, in, uh, they indeed they they are carrying bad assets in their in their on their books, but they are adequate. They have done uh, required most of them had uh, pretty good uh, provision coverage ratio okay. uh, so on most parameter banking sector is doing pretty well at this point of time i heard mr <coughs> kb come up sometime back talking that he has never seen such a robust banking system both in terms of making profits and uh, and in terms of capital and in terms of quality as assets in the past 50 years mm -hmm. but that's today but if you look back uh, 2020 March April when the actually COVID hit us and mm -hmm. we had we were subjected to lockdown, uh, it was a pretty bad situation because okay. you know that was the kind of situation that was the that was the time when the banking sector was just coming out of the woods. As all you know, uh, Reserve Bank of India instituted a first of its kind. Um, um, inspection of banks, uh, it's, which is called AQR, Asset Quality Review. Uh, for six quarters, um, with, uh, it said uh, you have to come out, uh, whatever the bank, I don't trust you, my inspectors have gone to your kitchen and find out too many skeletons in the cupboard and too many muck, too many things shoved under the carpet. 
so you come out clean uh, and uh, okay. and the following which we have we did find that you, you can see that from 2015 march onwards uh, npas were going up up and up mm-hmm. some of the banks particularly i i remember these two banks iob and iob in chennai and uh, uco bank in kolkata um, was almost one third of their banking assets were back mm-hmm. uh, so that that so that was happening in 2000 that the massive clean up drive 2000s over over the fiscal year 2006 7 and 8 and then as we are thinking that look clean up is almost getting over mm. the first phase of npa or the bad asset recognition was getting over and now the second phase which is the uh, after recognition is the recovery it start because mm. at record time we put ibc the the insolvency code in place in 2016 mm-hmm. that was a time banking banking sector was coming back to health and that's when the covid hit that's mm. when the lockdown came mm. and then we found the combined efforts between the banking regulator and the government mm. you see there is a bank of india brought down its its, its um, um loan rate i mean i mean the policy rate it's, it's historic low mm. in the past post uh, lehman uh, 2008 uh, mm. that was a that was the lowest till now mm. uh, till till the till 2020 that was the lowest uh, rbi brought down its policy rate mm. but in mm. 2020 to mm. two of cycle rate cut rbi brought down the repo rate to 4% mm. and because the system with flush with liquidity actually the reverse repo rate became the policy rate mm. and you know the reverse repo rate was cut even outside the npc meeting because mm. that's not within the npc limit so rbi bought its rate uh, policy rate to historic low and government came out with a series of um, steps you know and most critical of which is uh, is the is the credit guarantee scheme mm. and which been continuously been raised mm. i think it started with 3 lakh and then it, uh, as we speak it it rose to 5 Five and a half trillion, five point mm. five lakh crore. Mm. Uh, it was supposed to end this June. I think March thirty first was supposed to the banks sanction new sanction under that scheme, and by June, uh, sorry, new uh, sanction, yeah, and by June, as we speak, it should have ended like one month down the line. Mm. But the last budget finance minister said that it's been extended by one more year. Okay. and also it was added 50000 crore more so if i am mm-hmm. not mistaken if my memory serves correct it's 5.5 trillion scheme mm-hmm. and as 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 we move along move along mm-hmm. more and more more and more industries have got under this mm-hmm. so the most affected if you say the covid impact has been the msme segment mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. uh, the msme segment and many of them actually needed more than the debt they needed equity because mm-hmm. they ate up their equity they ate mm. up their capital mm. if a, if a shop is closed for for 3 months mm. you know, where is the money uh, so right. there this credit credit guarantee scheme came in handy mm. so i would i would say it was a combined effort between the banking regulator and the and the government and mm. and remember despite this all these schemes etc the our fiscal cost is much lower than most of the developed countries the, okay. the the money spent by the government to mm. tackle covid related mm. issues mm. Uh, mm. through these various kind of uh, you no know, concessions and dispensations and all is as a percentage of the G- gdp is mm. far lower than what say for instance us had spent okay uh, so it had been a nightmare situation i would say in the first year uh, fiscal 2020 um, when it started um, fiscal 2020 particularly the first year 2021 yeah. but as we speak and if we don't see any fresh wave i think we are banking sector is is has been able to withstand the uh, the the covid wave okay okay in a pretty pretty good shape there are of mm. course challenges i mean if you want to speak we can talk that later perfect perfect thank you so much uh, amal sir and uh, 
so this uh, so we are we are seeing lot of announcements from rbi and announcements from banking sectors also so what kind of uh, reforms have been done from the banking sector post pandemic sir no uh, you know the rbi took this opportunity to do a series of things um, i would not say only in the banking sector in the in the entire, entire financial sector okay one of them is essentially the the uh, it has introduced the scale based regulation for mm. for the nbfcs so the arbitrage opportunities between the banks and nbfcs mm. have been have been going away so essentially if you are a large nbfc you were treated almost on a par with the banks mm. you know uh, on two counts one is this npa npa uh, mm. the asset classification like for a bank uh, <clears throat> as you know we have this various technical categories special mention account a sma sma1 sma2 sma3 30 days mm. uh, overdue 60 days overdue 90 days overdue and once 90 days then it becomes npa 3 months you don't right. pay off the npa right. has um, um nbfcs were not subject to were not subject to those kind of norms mm. but now the the npa norms for banks and nbfcs are on a par and second mm. part is that the the so called lcr or the liquidity coverage ratio mm. now the banks have slr and crr and other stuff and the and the newly introduced lcr uh, similarly now the nbfcs also need to stay liquid it already mm. started i think if i'm not mistaken from december 21 and the three years time they will be on a par with banks so if you okay. ask me uh, rbi um, use this opportunity uh to bring in changes it's one of the many changes mm -hmm. and of course of course what we said the the entire uh, entire banking ecosystem and the advancement of technology mm -hmm. i heard uh, the uh, i heard uh, mr nandan ilkan is saying some uh, that what would have taken for years now it's happening in in months or even months. weeks mm -hmm. in weeks in, in weeks. weeks okay so so we have we have i think india is the most exciting place globally when mm. it comes to technology you know okay. the, the the entire credit delivery system the entire credit appraisal system and right, right from video kyc like you don't need to come to my office to video i can do your kyc right. that's only one example yeah. so um, uh, so that's another another thing you call it reform you call it evolution you call it change i think the banking sector is is now very different what it was 3 years back uh, because of the use of technology uh, and then of course the uh, between banks and nbfcs uh, the new relationships are happening the cool lending model is happening account yeah. aggregating account account aggregate uh, aggregators yeah. are, are giving licenses so which means it's it's not only it's not only uh the credit uh, bureaus but even others also can collect my data with my consent and that's been used so data is the actually new oil in the you know the entire banking sectors uh, mm. uh, keep it lubricated to the data and that is that is changing how the banking is done so the new relationships are being built uh, mm. new products are, in, are 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 coming out like say buy now pay later no? yeah Uh, if you even if you are say buying for instance 2 uh, uh, kilos of biryani uh, through zomato uh, mm. and paying probably 2 to 2400 or 2000 bucks mm. you don't need to pay 2000 rupees on the spot probably mm. you pay the first installment and over the next 3 4 6 installment uh, you pay off so we had spoken about micro loan uh, and uh, now it is micro micro loan even for thousands of rupees not mm. 20000 or 30000 even for 2000 rupees mm. so the, you can get uh, buy now pay later is one thing right. so it's 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 uh, uh, the new form it's the the dividing line between the banks and nbfcs are are being now abolished mm. the arbitraging opportunities have gone they are almost on a par okay a uh, new alliances are being formed uh, for originating loans or co lending whatever you call it yeah. new products are coming up uh, mm -hmm. like as i said buy now pay later um, new way of doing things like account aggregator you are not only depending only on on credit bureaus but there are others who can aggregate data 
Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. data is the new lubricant, new oil, oil for the Indian financial system. And I'm repeating uh, the digitization on the digitization front, India is the most happening place. And mm-hmm. apart from, apart from uh, lending and others, it's also have it, the maximum changes are happening in the payment space. Payments, okay. Mm-hmm. You know? And of course, um, one more thing is that even on the, not only on the asset sides, on the liability sides, you'll find uh, many of the banks are now raising money uh, through Google and other, Google and other yeah. things and all. I mean, yeah. uh, so be it on the asset side, be it on the liability side, be it on the systems, be it on the processes, everything is being changed. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm just shifting this topic to a totally different one, which is on the restructuring side. Even one of my friends uh, on the pandemic has opted for uh, restructuring the loan, opted for the moratorium option given by the RBI government. And the post that uh, even two weeks back when he applied for a loan again, and uh, he got rejected because of this restructuring has been done. And that this is one of the reasons being told uh, the loan has been rejected because of restructuring. So, so uh, people have opted for restructuring uh, in the pandemic situation, but uh, I, I would like to understand from your standpoint whether it is actually a boon or bane from a customer standpoint, uh, Tamil sir. No, you know, this is a very complex uh, issue. I mean, yeah. prima facie, I would like to believe that it's a big, big boon for the MSME segment, particularly mm. for the MSME segment. Mm. Had there been no government scheme, uh, which is which is that credit guarantee scheme, mm. which allows the banks, you know, certain percentage of your uh, your overall turnover, you can get as a fresh loan. I um, I have some numbers. I don't want to load you with the numbers, but less than half of 5.5 trillion have been used till now through that mm. process. So that is a big big advantage. And that's that's that they've done a great service for MSME because they are the most vulnerable segment. Mm-hmm. And if you see the other part <clears throat> on the on the on the corporate restructuring part, actually it did not happen as much as we had anticipated. If you remember, Reserve Bank of India constituted a committee under Mr. K. V. Kamak, mm-hmm. uh, um, which are the segment, which are the sectors um, which should come under the restructuring. Mm. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, probably they were anticipated about 7 trillion plus will be restructured. Mm. But in actual, in reality, I'm told the restructured asset is much, much less. Mm. So um, it, it, it was required. It had to be done. And remember, restructuring and, and the government guarantee, mm. it went hand in hand. It went hand in hand. And, 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 so okay. combine this both the combination. I think because of that, we are seeing that banking sector in a far better health than other ways it would have been. I, mm. I, I can't comment on the on the particular case of your friend. Mm. But one thing it worries me is this. Uh, if you look at the some of the banks, I would not name those banks, particularly in the MSME and SME segment, mm. if you see their earnings and if you see the have a, have a read the between the lines and look at going beyond the press release uh, look at their investor presentations mm. you will find that number of borrowers have not gone to the extent as mm. the the way their loan book has gone up okay in other words <laughs> the average loan given to an in, given to a person has gone up tremendously, 30, okay. 40, 50 percent. Mm-hmm. So here I am slightly cynical. Probably some of the banks are using this route to mm. evergreening, which means Mani Pakasarati, you are my MSME or SME customer. Client, yeah. You are not being able to pay back my loan. Mm. Your is existing exposure to me is 40,000 rupees. Mm. I pay you another 20,000 rupees to service your interest, you, you, your 20,000 rupees get into your account and get mm. out to pay me back. Uh, so this is how some of the, a few banks at least, okay, okay. my yeah. apprehension, mm. keeping them, keeping their, 
you know balance sheet look they, they it look healthy, healthy but yeah. uh, they will be exposed at some point of time mm. so this kind of this is a sort of backdoor restructuring uh, kind of stuff so that's definitely i mean it's not a healthy thing but okay. overall the restructuring initiated by the government uh, by the reserve bank of india mm -hmm. and um, and um, and and the support by the government in the form of guarantee credit guarantee i think these two things help the banking system and economy to a large extent and one more point you did not ask me i must tell you that we must also know when we say i mean the regulator uh, when to unwind this and when to reverse it because mm. one of the reasons of of the pile up in pas that we happened in 2014 15 16 mm. it's not me saying this there is a recent paper written by former reserve bank of india deputy governor uh, and uh, nibm director rakesh mohan and partha ray it says that to a large extent Reserve Bank of India is responsible because it did start a restructuring in December 2008 post mm. Lehman. It was supposed to last for a few years, mm. but it actually lasted almost a decade. And that helped the banks to hide their bad assets and mm. to create more bad assets. Mm. So if we don't want to repeat that, so I would like to believe as things look up, Touch it if there is no other way, fresh way of, 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 of COVID. And if we get back to the normal life, if the business cycle starts, mm -hmm. if the credit uh, cycle starts, which we have seen uh, last year, fiscal year 2021 credit, there is a marginal credit pickup uh, compared to the previous two years. If things are happening, mm -hmm. I think the RBI should start also unwinding or rewinding mm -hmm. this. Uh, we, we, would, we should not keep the restructuring window for a decade. Then we'll invite trouble. Okay, okay, okay. And uh, so, so the earlier question that you were answering about the uh, buy no pay later options are all coming booming, right? So, so what are the different segments of fintechs are coming? Uh, uh, so there are a lot of fintechs. I mean, when you compare in 2008, we hardly had uh, less than 200 fintechs. But right now, when in India alone, we are having 2,500 fintechs and almost some uh, 10x growth in, in terms of fintechs, right? So what kind of different types of fintechs uh, that are actually disrupting the Indian banking sector, Tamil sir? Moni, I am, you know, it, it's very difficult to say. I mean, I can reel out the names, etc. cetera. Uh, many of them are me too. And um, you okay. know, because of my profession, I probably end up two, three, four new fintechs startups mm. every month every week mm. <laughs> okay and and they have their own niches they have their own spaces mm -hmm. um, so um, or will all of them survive i don't know but mm. what is happening is that the alliances mm. there are two things happening um, you know the alliances between banks and nbfcs the alliances between uh, nbfcs and fintechs the alliances among banks nbfcs and fintechs mm -hmm. you know because not all the banks are nimble-footed. Mm. They do not have the kind of systems and processes in place. Mm. So they do reach out, be mm. it uh, loan recovery, uh, be it uh, meaning collection, be it uh, appraisal, and be it uh, actually um, um, identifying uh, the right kind of entities or right kind of people who should be given loan. So at mm. every stage, as I said, data is the new lubricant mm. uh, in the financial architecture. So the fintechs are playing in a very critical role, and you know you call them new banks, right. and many of them I I, um, I can I can just offhand can tell you like a bank like Federal Bank you will find that it has relationship to uh, quite a few a series of fintechs they call it new right. banks that for raising deposits. Right. Um, uh, similarly, there are other banks also uh, for uh, and. Um, uh, Equitas, SFB, small yeah. finance bank, it had mm. relationships. Right. So there are new relationships are emerging and they are emerging in different segments, mm. not only for, you know, right from, right from origination uh, to credit appraisal, to disbursement, to collection. Mm. Mm. 
Mm. Now, will the uni- the entire universe of fintech and the number of the startups will everybody be successful? Mm. Definitely will not. Behind every success story, there will be 10, 15, 20 unsuccessful stories because right. you know the space is too much. Everybody is jostling uh, for a space, for a foothold in the same space. But as we speak, I think it's it's better what we are seeing. I mean, we probably five years down the line, we'll see that uh, what's going to happen. Um, and of course, uh, that's a separate story right now, like uh, some of them or other, uh, um, I mean, I would not like to name, there is a there is a issue between value and valuation. I am a FinTech, I am in the same space, whether I'm creating much value, that's a separate story, but I'm create, creating tremendous valuation. And mm. people are chasing me and with every round of uh, fundraising, my valuation is going up, then I even go for IPO and then I fall flat on my face. Mm. There's at least one example, I, I would not like to name them. Mm. So. I would like to name this particular entity. Uh, okay. So, um, so this is, but 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 it's an interesting time. It's a very complex uh, ecosystem. Things are happening. We need to keep a close watch, and many of them will do well, but not all of them. Mm, 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 mm. Okay. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm sh- shifting the topic towards the public sector banks, right? Uh, so uh, the, there are there are obviously systems in place or uh, proper uh, uh, funds are allocated to tech and uh, and the private sector banks are uh, on the originating the loans or getting the NPA norms and all it's fine with the because they have a proper uh, tech systems in place but uh, unfortunately uh, public sector banks uh, are not I mean on the tech side they are uh, from from my experience uh, they are a bit uh, on the weaker side. So, uh, what kind of uh, uh, political pressures do bankers have? Because they they are they are not totally relying on the systems, but they are totally relying on the bankers who are operating in uh, public sector banks, right? So, what kind of uh, political pressures do bankers are having in the public sector banks, Tamil sir? No, Mani, you are asking two different questions and you are mixing the two. One is the political pressure, the so-called political pressure on the public sector banks. Yeah. And second is how efficient they are. Are they nimble-footed? Are they tech savvy? Now, let me take the second question first. Uh, the public sector bank you knew five years back and now they have changed. One of the reasons we have gone for consolidation I think there were some 24 or 26 odd banks. And if we include the uh, State Bank of India subsidiaries, probably even more, now we have 11 banks, mm. right? And many of them, uh, I mean, many of them are an offshoot of the, the consolidated uh, landscape uh, because two or three banks got together, uh, be it Union Bank or, 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 or be it Bank of Baroda, be it Punjab National Bank, be it Kanara Bank, etc. There are even smaller banks left alone, like say the Bank of Maharashtra here in Maharashtra, uh, in Pune, uh, like Punjab and Sin Bank in, mm. in, in, in North, like Uko Bank in, in West Bengal, or, or say IOB and Indian Bank in South. Now, why are they left behind? Why have they not been combined? Was it for political reasons, like every region have should one bank or etc. We, we don't, let's not get into that. Mm. Uh, and of course, uh, even we have um, relatively, there's relatively smaller, but relatively larger bank like Bank of India is here in Mumbai, mm. yeah, not touched on. Now, are all of them technology savvy? Certainly not. But mm. they are better than what they were. Mm. Now, in the pack of public sector banks, at least two banks I can I can often say, one is State Bank of India and one is Bank of Baroda. They are probably as good as some of the private banks when it comes mm. to State banks, you know, is a is a, is a great product, and it is doing a tremendous job. Mm-hmm. And as you are aware, recently, about a few months back, State Bank of India has got a direct recruitment uh, from the market uh, to 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 take care of the technology. Nitin Chuk, the former okay. CEO of Ujjivan Bank, has joined as as a deputy managing director in State Bank of India. Okay, so this is the second instance in the State Bank of history where somebody picked up from the market at the DMD level. Mm. Uh, there's an economist, I think 2008, nine at some time was picked up at the DMD level in the second section. So that shows state banks intention uh, to focus on technology in a big mm. way. Mm. 
mm-hmm. right? Bank of Baroda has been also is 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 pretty good. Rest of them, I am not very sure how how progressive they are mm-hmm. and how efficient and how well equipped are they. Okay. So that's the technology story. Okay. Uh, as far as political pressure is concerned, you know, it's it's a very, I mean, it's the very loosely we we do we do say that. Uh, it all depends on who is at the saddle. There are uh, CEOs who can withstand the pressure. There are CEOs who cannot withstand the pressure. But overall, if you have noticed that uh, since nationalization, we in India have been using the banking sector for a, for the greater good of the society and for the economy. So you look at PMJDY, um, the the uh, that smaller accounts. You you look at the percentage, the proportion or the percentage of total number of accounts opened by public sector banks mm. versus private banks. Mm. It's far, far higher by the public sector banks. Mm. Mm. Uh, so you have to do this. Or under this um, uh, government guarantee scheme, you look at how much money disbursed by public sector banks vis-a-vis private banks. Mm. Again, public sector banks. Are because okay. we end up using as a socio-political instrument our banks to change the lives of people. Mm. Now you can't have the best of both worlds because they are the listed entities. Mm. Now do you treat them as business entities? If you treat them as business entities, then you need to care about their quality of assets. You need to you need to look at those technical numbers, ROA and ROE, return on assets and return on equity, and so on and so forth. Mm-hmm. Then only the investors will get excited and put money on them. Mm-hmm. But what we have done is this, we have been continuously recapitalizing them from your money and my money, the taxpayers' money, mm-hmm. right? And we use them as a socio-political instrument to mm-hmm. change the people's life. Mm-hmm. Is, is there anything wrong with it? I'm not very sure. But Uh, I don't want to comment on that, but the limited point I'm making is this. You can't have the best of both worlds that we will use them as a socio-economic agent to change the lives of people. And at the same time, they should be profitable and run as business organization. Mm. In fact, uh, our prime minister also had said on, on some occasion, I heard him saying that the government does not have any business to be in business, in running mm. businesses. Mm. I think the realization has dawned on, on the government and which is why uh, the previous budget, not the 2021 February budget I'm talking about, the previous year, they spoke mm. about two, pri- two banks will be privatized. Uh, but it's not yet been done for whatever reason. Uh, LIC has gone to IPO, uh, but that, that response, have you seen the FII were not excited about it and it's not doing well. Uh, so it's it's difficult because you can't you just can't you have to totally divest yourself from managing the banks. You tomorrow you say, look, I will I will that IDBI kind of privatization where LIC is a proxy for government mm. and still you know it's run the way it's been done. It it should, it cannot be done. So probably the way forward is this: government needs to choose a few banks which will be instrument for social changes, upliftment of people, um, you know, and then rest of it, let them fend for themselves. Let them be privatized fully. They have great franchises. Mm. I mean, they have a great network. Uh, they are great liability franchises. And I'm sure there will be a lot of takers for them. So privatize some of them. Uh, start with two as an experiment. How does it work? Keep a few of them under the government fold and probably you delist them, and you you treat them as, uh, you know, as a as a as a social economic instrument. Just just uh, one the other uh, one example you say in Singapore, the DBS Bank, which is one of the best bank in this part of the world. DBS Bank started as a government entity, mm. uh, but now it's a it's a commercial entity because it was allowed to do things, which is should be done for business, not mm. for the greater good of the society. Okay. I'm repeating, you can't have the best of both worlds. You mm. are my bank. You give money whoever I want you to give. 
you come to the rescue of um, uh, of the uh, of, of people as and when they need you are an agent uh, for the socio economic change at the same time you are a professionally managed profitable organization you are a business entity your mm. roe is high roe is high so on and so forth mm. <laughs> it's absurd you can't have both you can have both okay okay on on the follow up question right on the political pressure right and uh, uh, i heard from one of your uh, old webinars that uh, uh, ceo of alagabad uh, was uh, sacked at the uh, very last day of his uh, final i mean last year of his duties and similarly a couple of other has been arrested because of this uh, 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 frauds happening so what is your comment on that on, on with respect to the political pressure tamil that was the question actually yeah no that that's not a political pressure that let me put it this way actually what happened is uh, mm. after this uh, reserve bank of india <clears throat> instituted the aqr asset quality review and this mm. we found that many of the banks have a lot of muck a lot of things the mm. um you know shoved under the carpet and then the scam i, I mean um uh, particularly this case you are talking about the ex punjab national bank ceo who was transferred to a smaller bank to elabad bank mm. and then mm. she was sacked at the last go at the, on the yeah. last day yeah. it's related to, it's related to the nirav modi scam correct correct yeah so similarly related to vijay malia there are a few other uh, idbi bankers um Uh, were arrested and all so this is an over activism by investigative agencies mm. now is every banker in terms of ethics and governance impeccable i would not say so mm. there could mm. be some rotten apple like in every profession like mm. uh, in your profession there will be some like in my profession among journalists there will be some Mm. among there is in in the profession of law in the profession of me, medical profession there will be some you know mm. one or two rotten apples there in every sack but uh, banking is uh, come under the glare the bankers because you are deal with public money mm. uh, that's why that's why uh, probably uh, and um, our investigative agencies and their public sector banks are subject to you know the three c's cbi uh, cvc and so on and uh, they're pretty aggressive and they wanted to probably um, uh, you know uh, give exemplary punishment uh, to the guilty uh, mm -hmm. so they are picked up from their homes they were arrested so on and so forth but they have not been uh, I, i can't think of any case uh, pro, uh, except for one very old case of gopala krishnan of bank of india is this in 19 um, in in 1990s he was mm. behind the bar for years uh, but in the recent past those uh, bankers who were arrested and sent to jail or lost their jobs or look look out notice were issued and they were prevented from going leaving india uh, there are many such instances but i am afraid i can't think of one single case mm. where their culpability has been proved you know you take commercial decisions and that commercial decisions can go wrong mm -hmm. there could be you are not qualified to take the decision your credit appraisal system was not not correct mm -hmm. your credit underwriting was not correct that so that that could be there mm -hmm. but that you are compromise money change be, uh, between you and the entity and that's why you are given the money and that's why the fraud has happened etc those things have not uh, we have not been able to prove and which is why one of the reasons our the dramatic drop in credit of tech is the, this the fear psychosis created among the bankers they are mm. afraid to give loan because you know uh, if you are a banker if you don't do anything you will not be arrested mm. uh, you will not be embarrassed and you are you you, you will secure your Uh, retirement benefit in terms of uh, pension and gratuity etc but i but if i want to take some commercial decisions and if a few decisions go wrong mm. and it leads to whatever it is uh, turning uh, loan turning bad and if the if it gets a fraud tag then then i am hauled up haul on the coal and then then rather i have not taken a decision mm. which is why just before covid if you see there were 
many occasions where our finance minister repeatedly ensured the bankers take decisions without fear and favor. Mm. We will not take. And at least there was one meeting where I think the CBI boss also with the bank, with the with, with, with the with the finance minister mm. at the bankers meeting, okay. telling and uh, ensuring them that that uh, we, we we will not disturb you, will not disturb you, will not haunt you. But it was a nightmare. Bankers were haunted. Bankers were hauled up and sent to jail. Uh, it, it, I mean. And you know, most of them, if not all of them, I think, I think probably all of them are retired bankers because to to pick them up and throw them into the jail, you don't need any kind of permission, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Which mm -hmm. if uh, a banker who is still on the payroll and and doing uh, and and working for a bank, it's difficult. You need certain permission, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. So it is an overactivism. It's a they wanted to create a demonstrative effect. Mm -hmm. I think that that backfired, that have not worked. And as I said, there is, I can't think of a single case where the banker's culpability was established. So okay. now, fortunately, uh, our investigative agencies are going smooth. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, uh, this, this is related to that uh, answer that you have told. Uh, can, I mean, the cases that you have told about the Nero Modi case and other cases like bankers have been sacked. So, can technology be the solution or the entire uh, system to be changed or uh, how, how do you see this? How, how, how can we solve this, uh, uh, this these problems in future, Tamal, sir? No, no it, it's not a question of uh, how can we solve, meaning I think the, I think the credit appraisal system and the, and the underwriting system is, is far better as we speak. Yeah. I think the bankers were little lax. Um, I'm talking about uh, post Lehman uh, when when there's a pressure from the government and uh, and, uh, and uh, from every quarter that you lend 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 you bring back the economy on the rail uh, to, to uh, uh, if you if you remember correctly we were not impacted by Lehman crisis as much as some of the other other countries. Right. Our growth came down only for a couple of quarters then it rose back yeah. and bankers played a very critical role. And mm. then there was uh, quote unquote pressure from the government to lend to the segment like infrastructure, et cetera, right, et cetera. Right. Mm. And then in the second phase of UPI government, the previous government I'm talking about before BJP came into power in 2014 mm. was the phase which all of us call policy paralysis. Things are not moving. There are many court cases. So there were externalities, projects were not picking up. So you can't blame the bankers alone. I mean, they did, they did uh, probably they were not as judicious as they should as they, they should have been mm -hmm. but at the same time the external factors also helped. and the uh, and at the same time that their credit appraisal system their underwriting was not up to the mark okay and finally finally what happened is this the obsession for balance sheet growth mm -hmm. which is particularly in the public sector happened it's mm -hmm. not you know you will find this is a very typical indian concept you will find the you will find uh, advertisement. They do the total business, which is which is credit plus deposit is X trillion. Mm -hmm. Now this is this is not the way you look at it. You either you talk about your total assets, which is credit, deposit, investment, the balance sheets, right. or you talk about your loan. Credit plus deposit, and I am so big, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is a very Indian concept, mm -hmm. and there is a hard mentality by the banking sector. Because mm. they want to grow their balance sheet, mm. you know, and then you know we are all in consortium lending. So some big bank has given loan, State Bank of India has given loan, a triple X amount, mm. and then whether irrespective of my risk appetite, Reserve State Bank of India is appraised and they are on the platform. I also need to be there so that my balance sheet can grow, mm. even though my risk appetite is different, my capital base is different. I should not be there, but I was there, mm. and that that's the reason. So the I call it the hard mentality. Uh -huh. So there are multiple factors led to that. A, the weak, relatively weak credit appraisal and underwriting system and monitoring system. Uh -huh. The hard mentality of the banks to uh, for the balance sheet growth. Uh -huh. The pressure from the government and uh, for, to lend to certain structure at that point of time. Uh -huh. And the external factors like various court cases, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right. where 
where the project could not even take off because the land acquisition was not complete because mm -hmm. somebody has gone Supreme Court. So, mm -hmm. so it was a cocktail of, you know, All it was a deadly cocktail of multiple things. Okay. okay. And um, it will be unfair to blame bankers alone. But yeah. yes, uh, they were less judicious mm -hmm. and they suffered from a hard mentality. Will mm. technology solve the problem? Technology is one of the props. As mm. I said, data. Uh, more than technology is the data and technology will dig the data. And the data will help us, is helping us to mm. appraise your, your credit worthiness. Perfect. I think that was a wonderful answer, Tamil sir. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, on the private sector banks, right? So I'm also hearing that the people are shifting towards private sector banks uh, because of support and other stuff, right? Tech. Um, so actually what is happening? Uh, are people are really moving from PSU to, I mean, private sector banks or is it true? Or if it is true, then what is the reason behind, sir? Uh, can you give no, a brief one? You absolutely. In fact, uh, if you see my last book, uh, Pandemonium, where I have a I have a section which is only the graphics where I mentioned that, you know, when you talk about the, 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 the what's the share of public sector banks, probably now 65, 66% in the entire banking industry. And the rest comes uh, private banks, which is both new and old, old is very little. And five or 6% is, is the foreign banks. But that's the stock. Mm. But if you see the, new scenario meaning incrementally at least i i am not i don't have the number of 2021 mm -hmm. uh, but i think till 2022 figure we there we gave incrementally a large portion not only of assets even of deposits are going to the private sector so mm -hmm. while on the stock private sector public sectors uh, uh, public sector share is 65% but probably for uh, Again, I'm not exactly, may not be true, but probably for every 100 rupee of new deposit, 70, 80 rupees is going to private sector. For every 100 rupee of, uh, of new loan, 70, 80 rupees going to the private sector. Incrementally, the new one. Now, why is it going? They're more aggressive. They're more tech, tech savvy. They're, uh, they're, they're faster. So the, the concept that public sector is a proxy for sovereign. My money is safe with public sector and I will keep my money with public sector is myth. Public sector is losing out on deposits too. As mm. far as credit is concerned, you look at the numbers. You look mm. at the numbers of the past two, three years, you will find some of the private banks have continued to grow at 15 to 20% where the public sector, some of them actually did not grow at all. There was negative growth. I did mm. not want to name them. Look at 2019, 2020, even 2021 figure. There was hardly single digit growth or even negative growth for, for, for all of them, mm. for many, many of them. So both on credit and deposit side, public sector banks are losing out. The reasons are private sector banks are more nimble footed, more technology savvy and more I would not call them more customer friendly, but they're faster, faster in yeah. loan appraisal, mm -hmm. faster in loan processing, faster in reaching out to uh, you, faster, um, you know, more aggressive. So the, particularly, I was also surprised that, you know, we, we believe that uh, public sector banks are, the, are a sovereign, you know, proxy for government. My money is safe. But when I saw that, out of every 100 rupee of deposits or new deposit, I think 70 odd rupees or 75 odd rupees going to private banks. So that myth is busted. Okay. 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 How intelligently uh, banks are handling their NPAs? Uh, uh, so we are, we are reading a lot of your blogs. So I just want to understand how, how banks are handling their, these NPAs and uh, any case studies that you can refer just uh, just want to quickly. Uh, no, uh, no, the scene is better. If you look at the Reserve Bank of India come out with its uh, health report every six months in June yeah. and December. Mm -hmm. Last year, uh, last two years, it was slightly delayed. It's called FSR, Financial Sector Stability mm -hmm. Report. Mm -hmm. If you see on the NPA front, Reserve Bank of India's estimate actually they overestimated the real NPA is lower. Now, mm -hmm. other banks are hiding, not. I, I think they are more, as I said, on the, on the one hand, they are, they are, their credit appraisal system 
uh, and their credit underwriting and their monitoring they have all have improved they've learned the lessons up okay. after the rbi's aqr what i was telling you know <laughs> no offense intended banks were doing belly dancing belly dancing but rbi forced them to do stiff cheese so they were exposed completely and after yeah. that there is no way but to go back and put their house in order so bankers have become wiser uh, their back office and as i said credit appraisal um, credit monitoring underwriting is far better that's one one part of it and yeah. other part of it is, is because they are also back to profit they are um, doing they are they are making provision for bad assets so the so called provision coverage ratio of the some of the banks are very high which is why even though the gross bad loans are very high you will find that for instance publish uh, look at the um, idbi bank you will find the gross uh, npa is probably 20% i don't remember exactly but net npa is very very low probably 2% because mm. everything is provided for mm. now once you have provided for as and when you recover that money comes to you and mm. adds to your profitability and makes you more stronger so i think bankers are a wiser lot in mm. every way at this okay. point of time mm. okay. okay they are they are handling in pa much uh, much better much smarter way and probably mm. that hard mentality of balance sheet growth uh, they have they have paid a price for that and they are no more going for that which is why let there be no credit growth also i don't care but i care for quality credit okay okay um and uh, about your uh, uh, can you give a uh, intro about your book sir uh, the indian banking tragedy pandemonium so it's it's a long story i i don't want to uh, it's it's there's no time it just i mean in 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 a very short two minutes i wanted to take a deep dive into what's happening in the banking sector mm -hmm. and this book it's um, it's called the pandemonium the great indian banking tragedy it has won uh, quite a few awards including the tata lit fest award uh, the best business book uh, is essentially what went wrong in the banking system and it it did not stop there it's gone beyond the banking system it spoke about what happened in the nbfc segment uh, what happened among the credit rating agencies and and what happened in yes bank and icici bank so it it gives both micro and macro data and most importantly i think going beyond uh, what you see it tried to unfold the behind the scene drama like mm. aqr reserve bank of india how how the aqr was conceptualized and how it was implemented to give a to, to give you just simple one example this aqr was done by the reserve bank of india's division uh, after they set up the clic database clic database is the database which is not meant for public you and me even the rating agencies do not have access to the clic database the, okay. but the banks are uh, need, banks are needed to keep this data to to inform reserve bank of india and mm. pass on the data about the every about every large loan i think 5 crore plus or 50 crore plus i don't remember exactly mm. with the clic so the clic data first give the reserve bank of india idea that things are not correct mm -hmm. and then they went for raghuram rajan uh, was the governor they went for this aqr and aqr meaning that i will i my inspectors will check your book and it was done not from reserve bank of india central office but its other office from the top red and it was it was like a, you know for instance money you are an inspector in one particular bank and you see that one loan is not being repaid for 87 or 88 days then you check with the ceo of the bank look this is this loan is only two days left 88 days this loan is not yet paid back aren't you aren't you classifying it as npa the ceo says hang on we know the customer he mm. can pay back mm. and lo you will find on 90th day the money is come has come mm. it's good so you are very impressed with the banker that yeah the banker tells the truth and this is indeed the money has come back but two days later you find out from your uh, another inspector from another bank that money actually left your bank has gone on to the other bank again to to meet this 90 day norm so what okay. happened in a consortium lending you and me and x and y lend to one particular borrower okay say 500 yeah. crore 1000 crore etc 
but mm. our disbursement date are different. Yeah. So your 90 day is different from my 90 day. Uh, and my 90 day is different from Mr. X's 90 day, bank X's 90 day or Y. Right. Right. Probably two, three days gap there. So money was, you call it circular trading or whatever it is, just getting into your bank, making uh, my account, uh, so my account is a regular account, then leaving your bank and coming to going to some other bank, making my account there also a servicing, uh, I mean, a good account. And then going to the third bank, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And Reserve Bank of India busted that racket. And that's how the EQR happened. So this book graphically described what went wrong. And, and there's a lot of drama in it. And um, so if you want to understand what happened exactly, how we got into the mess, and what's the, what's the role the rating agencies played, what's the role the bank like ICICI, uh, CEO, the bankers like ICICO or Yes Bank CEO played. Uh, what happened? What was the reason for the NBFC crisis? Uh, was it was it a, a out and out fraud or was it a asset liability mismatch? How mm -hmm. did they get into this? Mm -hmm. So this book is a little heavy in terms of research, but I tried to make it readable. And um, as I said, and also. Uh, there is a unique thing about the book is, of course, I lifted the idea from some other book uh, overseas is a chapter only uh, it tells the numbers. So if you don't, if you don't want to read the book, you just go through the chapter, like go through that chapter. One page tells you how the public sector banks incremental, incremental market share is going okay. down dramatically. Mm. Or another page tells you uh, where do you stand BJP, 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 Vis a vis the G20 nations about okay. the, the zombie lending. Mm -hmm. Or yet another page tells you the gap between uh, chairman leaving or CEO leaving and another CEO coming into a public sector bank. Mm -hmm. In some cases, more than a year. Now, mm -hmm. how do you run a bank without a CEO? CEO. Yeah. The, uh, it's remaining more than a year. Mm -hmm. So that's all. I mean, I don't want to, I can talk about an hour, but um, I, I don't think the time, per, time permits us. So yeah, it's yeah. the way I wanted to, uh, I wanted to take a deep dive okay. and, uh, and it has got a good response. I'm happy that uh, it's okay. been appreciated and people like it. Okay. Yep. okay. I, last week I bought the book, sir, and I started reading it. It was really uh, informative. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, sir. And I just uh, switching the questions to audience, just we'll take two questions. Um, question from Vijayan is how compliant are Indian banks as far as Basel 3 norms? How compliant are they? I, I uh, honestly, money, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not exactly qualified to answer this question. Okay. Because uh, this, this get evolves and every time we, we see also RBI uh, postponing certain dates, etc, etc. So, but I don't think we are off the mark. I think on every every globally uh, accepted norms, we are on the right track. Beyond mm. that, if you ask me at the specific bank, who is more advanced and who is less advanced, et cetera, et cetera, I, I am just not qualified to answer this question. Mm -hmm. And uh, another question from Maniket uh, is, so do you see the freebies or subsidies or form uh, loan waivers, right? Impacting adversely the fiscal expenditure of the government or RBA policy? Shouldn't nope. we yeah, learning something from Sri Lanka is what uh, uh, his question is all about. So what is absolute, absolutely you don't need to tell me. I mean this 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 uh, loan waivers is not the right thing to do. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, it has happened, and that's not only done by the central government. Even if you see in the state elections, um, uh, most of the state elections, the incumbent or or. Uh, even the competition, they 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 promise one of the poll promises is this: once okay. we come back, we'll waive your loan. It certainly destroyed the it destroys the credit culture, and one of the reasons uh, the investors are not very happy with the microfinance segment in India's microfinance segment is this because yeah. the externalities uh, is too much in as far as microfinance is concerned. Okay. At this okay. point of time, we are talking about the COVID impact, but periodically particularly the low, the microfinance segment, the small and micro borrowers, you know, that particular, the, the, that particular segment, the lenders are subjected to this loan waiver, which mm. is, which 
as I said, even if I am capable of paying, I would not like to pay because there's a loan waiver. So it's, it's, there is a direct and indirect impact. And I wish we learn from the past and we stop this practice. Okay, okay. And one, one last question, sir. Uh, so whether new banks like Jupiter give a better service and push traditional banks back, given they are 100% they are branchless and pure technology driven banks. So, uh, the name you the name you are talking about, we are calling them new banks, etc. But you know they are not Reserve Bank of India licensed bank, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, we need to figure out they are raising deposits on on behalf of certain other banks. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, this this situation is evolving, but branchless banking, I'm not very sure um, in India how how many years it will take. Because, you know, when, when I'm taking loan from you, I don't care whether you have branch or not because the risk is yours. But when I am keeping money with you, trust plays a very, very critical role. Trust plays it. And then I want to make, to, to see you, to feel you. It's not Amazon. I, I, just, uh, I just order something and I get comes to this thing and all. There I want to make this, this feeling, this is seeing and creating trust. That's what happened. So branchless, you were talking about the India going for branchless banking. I don't think it's going to happen one or two or three years down the line. Okay. Uh, okay. If you call them bank, I'm not very sure the name you said we can call them bank in that sense because it's not oh. an RBI licensed bank. Okay. But they are raising deposit on behalf of the banks. And okay. finally, some of our banks, I would not name them, they are, they are digital. They are over 90% of their transactions are digitally made. They yeah. have their branch net network. Probably they are not going for huge branch expansion anymore, but they are digital. So, I mean, for instance, State Bank of India, as you know, that's a digital bank. You know, okay. so whether it's State Bank of India or ICICI or Access uh, or HDFC and all, or Bank of Baroda, they're all digital banks. Okay. I mean, okay. All right, sir. I think, uh, thank you so much, Tamil, sir. Uh, I, I'm getting a lot of questions in WhatsApp and as well as in messages, but uh, uh, on the, in the interest of time, uh, I'd like to close the session. So uh, audience, please, what are questions that you have, uh, please feel free to send out an email. I'll be happy to get the response from Tamil, sir, and respond to you uh, once it's done. So uh, over to you, Shweta. Before ending the webinar, as Mani, sir, told, we are really sorry. We couldn't take all the questions. So please, uh, Feel free to share with them with us. And then before ending the webinar, I would like to give a huge thanks to Mr. Tamil Bondubatya for imparting us with like immense knowledge. And uh, we have uh, like seen so many comments agreeing with Tamil sir on his points from LinkedIn and uh, uh, as well as in Zoom. And thank you so much for the participants and the Hapalti for making it possible. And a huge thanks to Tamil sir. And uh, once again, thank you, everyone. I hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, Vimala, Sheta, and Mani, uh, thank you from my side for hosting me. And stay safe. Don't let your <coughs> don't let your guards down. Uh, sure. Stay safe. And sure. thank you from my side. Thank, thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you sir. so much.